When you're traveling by air, you want to be sitting in a comfortable seat. Private aircraft take comfort to a level far above that of commercial airlines, with seats that are as cozy and luxurious as fine furniture. They must also be lightweight and fire resistant. On private and corporate aircraft, it's all about luxury seating. Armchairs often swivel and, at the push of a button, recline with an extending footrest. The cushions are constructed from layers of fireproof foam containing carbon fiber for optimum support and durability. Workers cut the cushion pieces using a bandsaw with a round blade that slices through foam without tearing or shredding it. They spray adjoining surfaces with water-based contact cement and assemble them. The assembly combines different thicknesses in three different densities to make the cushion soft in certain areas and rigid in others. The densities are color-coded. After letting the glue dry for 12 hours, workers begin the final shaping. This is the seat cushion assembly. They first saw through it laterally to make it the right thickness. Then they temporarily adhere a plastic template of the final cushion shape, trace it, then saw along the trace line. Next, using the technical drawing as a guide, they mark, then grind the cushion's rounded profile. Holding the next layer of foam over the edge, they verify the shape with another template. Then, they mark lines for the cushion's creases and, with a foam saw, cut them five centimeters deep just enough to insert Velcro strips, the backsides of which they glue to the foam with water-based contact cement. Workers construct the back rest cushion just like the seat cushion, assembling foam pieces of different thicknesses and densities, shaping the perimeter, grinding the edge profile, cutting and Velcroing creases. Then they apply a final layer of soft foam 13 millimeters thick folding the edges onto the Velcro inside the creases. They do the same with the seat cushion, armrests, and footrest. All the foam cushions are now ready to be covered in genuine leather. In accordance with safety regulations, the supplier rendered the leather fireproof by treating it with a calcium-based solution. Seamstresses trace patterns for the cover pieces, then cut them out. They line the perimeter of each piece with double-faced tape. Fold over the edges to create a neat hem and trim the corners flat. Then they sew on Velcro strips where required. Finally, they assemble the pieces into covers, sewing an identification label in each one. They hammer every seam flat to prevent bulges. Then, they sew what's called a French stitch, a line of straight stitches on either side of each seam. Meanwhile, workers glue fireproof polyester batting to the foam. This layer between foam and leather will even out the surface. They tear the perimeter of the batting to thin it out. Finally, it's time to dress the cushions in their covers. Workers use a metal rod to help push the leather deep into the creases without bunching up. Velcro strips on the cover adhere to the Velcro strips inside the creases. The covers also have Velcro closures, and certain cushions have Velcro strips on the bottom, which attach to the seat structure. Once all the covers are on, workers can complete the seat assembly. They attach the armrests to the structure with screws. Then install the footrest, which attaches with Velcro. It contains a cavity for storing the life vest. The seat cushion also attaches with Velcro. The passenger seats and pilot seat are constructed the same way except that the pilot's seat often has a sheepskin insert on the sitting surface to absorb sweat and keep the pilot cool and comfortable. 
It was the ancient Romans who first began using cremation urns. Today, the custom continues. The remains are stored in urns permanently or sometimes temporarily before burial. And with cremation, one's final resting place doesn't have to be six feet under. The cremation urn has an important place in some households. It's a constant reminder of the dearly departed, helping to keep the memories alive. The urn starts with a concept. The potter draws a large-scale design, which he'll use as a reference as he shapes a prototype urn from clay. He slaps a lump of clay onto the potter's wheel. The wheel spins and the potter begins to transform the shapeless lump into the desired form. The process is called throwing, a potter's term for shaping. He leaves the bottom open so the walls can be more easily formed into the desired shape. He'll add a base to the urn later. As he pulls up the clay to produce the walls, he works it to a uniform thickness. He gathers the top to narrow the opening, a technique known as collaring. Then, with the potter's wheel at a stop, he takes the shape from round to rectangular and tapers it at the neck. Then it's into a casting box, which exposes only half of the urn prototype. He brushes a release agent onto that half. Using a mixer, he whips up a mix of plaster and water. He blends it until it thickens to the consistency of pancake batter. The liquefied plaster will harden in minutes, so he quickly pours it into the box with the urn prototype and fills it right to the top. As the plaster hardens, the exposed urn prototype makes an impression of half of the urn. He'll make another one exactly like it for the other half of the urn. He'll attach them with a key system. For this, he drills notches in one mold half. The notches match up with raised areas on the other mold half to align them. He ties the molds together with suspender-like straps, cinching them tightly together. He adds a base to the urn and straps it to the other two pieces. He sets the assembled mold upright, exposing the opening of the urn. He's now ready to make a copy of the original urn. In fact, he'll make 20 at once, using 20 identical plaster molds. He pumps liquid clay into each one, filling it to the brim. Over three to four hours, the plaster absorbs water in the clay it comes into contact with, causing it to solidify. The clay in the center remains liquid. He pours that into a barrel to be strained and reused. And now, the big reveal. He opens the mold and removes the urn. It's exactly like the prototype sculpted by the potter. He lifts a lid from another plastic mold and checks the fit to the urn. After drying and an initial firing to harden the clay, a worker coats the urn and the lid with a glaze, working from the inside out. The glaze is a mixture of finely milled minerals and water. It adds color and a glass-like non-porous surface when fired a second time. Cremation urns come in a range of styles and colors. Customers often make a selection that reflects the taste of the deceased. Another worker now brushes a mixture of wax and alumina onto the neck of the urn and the lid. This will keep them from fusing together during the final firing. They fire the cremation urns at a very intense 1,195 degrees Celsius for about 15 hours. This transforms the clay into a durable ceramic. They cool the urns slowly for 13 hours to prevent cracking. Four days in the making, these urns are now ready to contain a loved one's remains and in so doing, honor a life. <laughs>